Welcome to this session on imagining multiple models of ministry with you. This is a series hosted by the Calvin Institute of Christian Worship. I am Dr. Elizabeth Tamez Mendez, Executive Director of New Generation 3 and longtime collaborator with CICW. Today, Dr. Cristian de la Rosa of Boston University is joining us for conversation. Dr. Cristian, thank you for being our guest today. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm so happy to be part of this initiative and I'm looking forward to sharing uh, out of my experience, out of my um, uh, work and ministry with young people. Yes, we've had this conversation pending for several years. So I'm very excited personally that we finally get to, to have this very luxurious space for us to talk. And so thank you for this. And in this series, we want to learn from one another about community worship practices in different contexts, especially those that encourage intergenerational relationships and empower youth. And Dr. Christian, would you please share with us a bit about your context and your work? We're really eager to get to know more about it. Thank you. Uh, well, um, uh, again, Christian de la Rosa, I'm originally from Mexico. I lived in United States for a long time, uh, involved mainly within the United Methodist Church. I'm an elder, ordained elder with the United Methodist Church, the New England Conference. And I serve now at um, Boston University School of Theology as a Dean of Students and Community Life and Faculty for Contextual Theology and Practice. So I enjoy really uh, working um, in, in almost every topic issue um, that is relevant uh, to today's um, uh, experiences. Uh, so I can turn almost any topic into a class. But what I enjoy the most, I believe at this point in my journey is really facilitating the formation of new generation of religious leaders. And uh, what I mean by religious leaders is those that are going to become uh, clergy, but also those that are going to be involved in our communities um, uh, out of their faith uh, commitments and, and faculty in seminaries, as well as those that really um, have a, a Christian foundation uh, or a religious foundation, mainly Christian foundation as a way of engaging, organizing in at any level, in any spaces, through any issues that, that call for justice. So one of the initiatives that I um, have at Boston University School of Theology is uh, that I direct the national, uh, it's a national initiative with the United Methodist Church. And now we included the Episcopal Church or the Episcopal Church also is working with us. And it's called the, the Hispanic Youth Leadership Academy. So that's, that's part of what I do in terms of, of the, the formation of young people. And we, we serve with um, high school students, college students, and some uh, seminary students. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Christian. It's so good to learn about what is happening in your context and in your ministry. And as we frame our conversations in this series, we have chosen five values for corporate worship and models of ministry with you. These are youth agency, spaces for theological questions, the role of the family, sparking intergenerational relationships, and designing multiple pathways for ministry with you. Dr. Cristian, how has your work with Latino youth and young adults through the Hispanic Youth Leadership Academy um, shaped all these uh, spaces for youth agency and theological questions? What practices have you been able to integrate in your work at the academy to create um, the, the right environment so that youth want to explore their questions about faith, religion, theology, and just life in general. Uh, well, let me let me add a little bit more in terms of um, the work that I do uh, with particular with the Hispanic Youth Leadership Academy, which I think is, is uh, more direct and relevant to um, this conversation. And again, uh, we serve with uh, high school students uh, it's a national program and, uh, and also college students, all Latinx students. And a model um, in the design is that uh, we basically began working with high school students. And the idea was to continue serving only with high school students, helping them with uh, four components uh, in the design of the curriculum. We have a three-year curriculum where we accompany them through their experience of high school to make sure they graduate and they, they are ready to go to university. 
The four components in the design of the curriculum are discernment of call, education, uh, their plan for higher education, uh, leadership formation, and then uh, commitment and awareness about uh, pressing issues in the community, so skills for community organizing. So those are the four components in the design of the curriculum. When the first group graduated, they wanted to continue and we were not sure how to have, have them come back. So we um, encouraged them to suggest how they might want to come back. And they made two suggestions. One was to create a college component where they can continue to grow and we could accompany them through their um, four years of university. And they also wanted to come back and help in the leadership of the high school students. So that was wonderful because this model is very unique where uh, we work with high school students and the leadership team and the mentors are college students that went through the program. And then for the college students, we have seminary students that are in the leadership team uh, and, and serve as mentors for college students. And then you know, we also tap into um, PhD students to mentor and, and be resources for a seminary students. So it's an intergenerational effort where they are uh, being formed, but they also, uh, commit to form and participate in the formation of the next generation after them. And definitely that makes the program very relevant. But one component that I'm, I'm always surprised, particularly with high school students, and I wanna share this example with you, is that um, I'm always concerned about the biblical interpretations that we have. And as you know, biblical interp interpretation is so fundamental uh, for our formation, particularly for young people what we believe, what we understand, what are the values that, that are important for us, and what is our perspective in life. All of that is, is really grounded, particularly in our Latinx um, context and in Spanish-speaking congregations or, or Latinx congregations or Latin American congregations is our interpretation of the Bible or our, our understanding of the interpretation of the Bible. So one of the elements that, that really empowers youth and really I can see their agency coming, to, you know, coming into play is that uh, this conversation that we have about what is theology first and then who does theology? And then the realization that everybody can do theology. It's not left only for the pastors or the Sunday school teachers or the theologians or the professors at seminary. Everyone, in, you know, a person of faith, every human being, even if they don't know it, they're doing theology. So that's a finding that for high school students is like such a surprise. And then, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a big paradigm so, change. You know, I can read the Bible and I don't have to like, uh, you know, just go to the, you know, I read the Bible and then I go to the translation or the interpretation of the pastor, or the Sunday school teacher, because as you know, you know, particularly in Spanish, where we are guided into this memorizing, you know, <laughs> uh, effort, you know, I'm a, a good Christian. If I can, I can memorize all the books of the Bible or all uh -huh. the texts or the interpretation of every text. I don't even think through it. I just memorize and, and that's great. So we pick a, a, an interpretation. So, but for high school students, it's, it's wonderful to see how they realize that everyone can do theology, that, um, that, that it's important to engage the text. And in the United Methodist tradition, we do it through this uh, method that we have, we call it the, uh, the Wesleyan quadrilateral, or, or it's basically a Wesleyan way of doing that our founder John Wesley used uh, himself. And so we adopted it as a way of doing theology, but also as a way of living our life, making any decision in the process. And so we explained the, the high school students about part of our uh, of our tradition as, as people from the Wesleyan um, movement, the Wesleyan uh, tradition as United Methodists. We have these four elements that we take into consideration when we interpret Bible and when we make any decision in life. And is that um, we take into consideration the tradition the history of our denomination, what is traditional in our denomination. We take into consideration the importance of a scripture and we take into consideration the, the importance of our own experience, how we then engage these three through reason. And reason is, is all the other elements that, that combine with the importance of formal education. And so these four elements, tradition, scripture, experience, and reason help us to, to interpret. 
So after we talk about that, and you know, this is not simple with the young people, but they can pick it up very quickly. So we talk about what is theology, who does theology, method that we use in our tradition, and alongside the importance of, of taking leadership in all this, because again, the academy is this whole thing of you are a leader, you know, you are information, and you 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 we expect you to be a leader within the denom denomination within the community, mm -hmm. and so we give them then a passage from a scripture, and one of my favorite passages. Uh, it comes from Matthew. Uh, it's, it's Matthew 15, 21 to 28. And it's, it's uh, the one about uh, the mother that her child, the Canaanite women, and, the, and it parallels the Syrophoenician women. And so, you know, these women stops Jesus and the disciples, and it becomes a, a real intense argument. And so I asked them, you know, look at this passage, forget anything that you heard, what is going on in this passage? And again, use your experience. And they can easily, very easily relate this passage to racism today, <laughs> to sexism today, to the, to the reaction of Jesus that is so unexpected. Jesus doesn't want to help these women. And, and so they question that. And then, you know, at the end, particularly the young women can see how women have power. These women had the power to stop Jesus and the disciples on the way to wherever they were going. And she would not allow them to leave until they answer her. So she, you know, in a way, uh, I like using this passage because it's the agency of the women before Jesus and the disciples. And if they are really preaching a new reality, a new, a new uh, family in this world, then they need to include women. And so this becomes a very liberating explanation. And, to, and I love hearing it from high school students wow. because they can bring all of this into play into what they see in the text. And, and it's almost like uh, it's the first time that they are able to do that, or they, they, they are allowed with a relig older religious leaders or, uh, or pastors and, and faculty are allowed to, to even say what they think about a scripture mm -hmm. and then relate it to current issues, to the struggles that they have themselves and, and what is going in community. So then it yeah. facilitates a way that we can then talk about pressing issues like racism, classism, sexism, and all of that yeah. comes in there. So, so I think that is a component that, that we um, really work with in the, in the academy, the Hispanic Youth Leadership Academy or HILA, in terms of facilitating the agency, the empowerment that, that we hope will help young people to continue using this method um, for interpretation of scripture, but also for their own decisions in, in life. And I think um, you pointed out something very important at the beginning, uh, where this model, it's, it's something that is easy for us to replicate, um, not easy perhaps in the process or the how-to, but easy in the sense that this can be done in our different contexts, right, where we bring different generations together. Um, that's so important that the younger are learning from the others and they're coming together and they're seeing themselves as interconnected in the formation of one another. And that's very unique in the way that um, the Hispanic Youth Leadership Academy is working, that you purposely mm -hmm. make sure that high school students and college students and seminary students and PhD students are all coming together and being able to shape and inform one another. Um, yeah. And then in this practice of uh, specifically theology and giving example, right? Because we see that all the time um, in, in our context to be able to see someone else that's a few mm -hmm. steps ahead of you and to know that, okay, I'm struggling right now to make it in my academic journey or, or the next steps in my process. And yet I get to see somebody else who's almost like, okay, look, see, it's possible. <laughs> it happens. Um, and I think a, a lot of our congregations and organizations can, can implement this type of thinking. Right? It's like, how do we create more of these intergenerational spaces and in the leadership of mentoring? Um, and not only thinking of mentoring as adults to younger um, youth, but the youth in different stages speaking to each yeah. other's life. Yeah. And, and it, it, there is a lot of informal, well, what in the academy or in the social systems we might call informal mentoring, but really for me is mentoring of life. You know, and again, we go back to the, the importance of community. I mean, our communities are not, uh, I don't think we are designed to be individual, individualistic 
or build our own uh, formation or our own build our own careers individually. Uh, I think we're it's, it's a collective e effort. You know, uh, it, it's, we need to do it in community. And so, what I find also another experience with the Hispanic Youth Leadership Academy is that the, we find this peer mentoring when we're on site, and even after the events, we we hold academies in the summer for a week long. A groups of 15 or 20. We never have more than 20 in, a, in, a, in an academy. And they move from one, uh, the curriculum is a three-year curriculum. So they're together every summer for at least a week. But then through the year, they communicate with each other. They have their own ways of uh, structuring and they come back the next summer and the summer after. And then, so there is a lot of peers, peer mentoring that happens there, advising each other and, and helping each other. But also within the program every night, we build in what's called Hila after dark. And meaning when we finish the dinner and the evening presentation, we basically just find them a big room where they can stay up late and, and talk about whatever they want to talk about. And, uh, and we just provide the pizza or what it, sandwiches or whatever, food and drink that they want, um, sodas. And then, um, you know, one or two of us might be outside the door and make sure that, you know, everything is okay, particularly with the high school students. We don't have to do this with the college students, but the high school students, two of us always have to be with them. And so, but we don't, uh, we don't provide them any content. They decide what content, and if they want, they can call us in the room to, uh, you know, to, to help with whatever. Uh, but most of the time they are telling each other that the debriefing the, the new information, but they're also building on whatever they find. And then I find that they, that generates generates questions for the next day, or um, they might even you know change the emphasis that we have on a particular topic for the following days. Uh, so it's a space of debriefing and mentoring. But also the, I find that even after the events, the high school students will continue to communicate with the college students that were in the leadership teams that led that particular academy. And the same with the college students that led with a, with a, with a uh, seminary students. So that's, that's part of the, this mentoring that happens in a very, I, I will say in a, in a, in a very, um, uh, um, is part of our processes as community. I will, I call, I'll say it's a collective process that happens that we don't plan for and probably will take a bunch of money to structure and we don't want to really structure it because then we're limiting what they, yeah. they can talk about, what they can have, what they can do. Mm -hmm. So so I find that very helpful. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you pointed out something very important also for different contexts in ministry that um, giving them that freedom, that spaces mm -hmm. to be, and it's, it's very interesting what arises from it, right? And it's just, um, it's almost like give them the space, nurture um, the community, and they will, they will inform you. I know a lot of readers are always wondering what is it that they want, what they want to talk about, what do they want to do? And when we create these spaces for them to just get together and have conversations, it, they, they provide us the answers, right? And, and I, that was something very unique about what you said in, in um, the Hispanic Youth Leadership Academy. We asked them, we asked them, we mm -hmm. asked them, Oh, what, how, what would be some intentional ways for us to continue our community? Because it makes sense, right? They, they spent this time together for three years. They built some very deep relationships that were, were not just for the moment, but um, you have done such a wonderful job in, in helping them curate and continue to nurture those relationships even one year after the other. And now mm -hmm. they're like, what? We're done. We graduated. No, we want more. Exactly. <laughs> and, exactly. and I think the, the importance of that, right? That um, I think a lot of people are always wondering, what is it that you need? It's like, this, this is it. Mm -hmm. This is what they need. They need these communities when, where they know they're heard, where they have close relationships, where they know that I want to come back. Nobody has to ask me to come mm -hmm. back to this to this program, right? Or, or or has to bribe me to say, come on, let's go during the summer. It's just like. I'm, I'm sure they're like counting down the days mm -hmm. and then to have this yeah. type of agency to say well, one way we could continue this and stay together and, and um, it comes to shape the, the next uh, program that you're doing with with uh, spaces for theological discussions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think also uh, what really contributes uh, um, to these, these spaces contribute to identity formation. 
you know, the piece of the curriculum that contributes to, to um, agency and empowerment, because a, a great deal for these uh, young leaders is has to do with um, my own agency, how to really, the, uh, how do I identify and deploy my own agency, and how do I gain power? Yeah, I, I have this sense of, of uh, empowerment, but really each person has their own power. So it's more like, how do I take power in a way that that helps me to uh, succeed, not only to survive, but to actually succeed and do well. Um, so I think that uh, part of the curriculum that we have also is we talk about uh, pre-Columbian um, uh, spirituality, pre-Columbian cultures before the introduction of Christianity that is so essential to our own identity as people of the Americas. And, and I mean, for most of them, it's the first time they ever address this. Uh, most history talks about, you know, begins with the introduction of Christianity, or even when we look at world world history, there's very little, unless you take a specific class about ancient uh, civilizations or whatever, everything begins with Christianity. Well, we did not begin with Christianity as, as Latinx, uh, Latin American communities. There was, there's so much still uh, about us that has to do with pre-Columbian cultures, religions, uh -huh. um, understandings, languages. And so part of our curriculum uh, for these academies, also uh, a, a big piece on um, elements that will contribute to uh, uh, retrieving our own identity, retrieving points of reference um, that we need for our own identity. So I find that so empowering for the young people because they don't, they will not get their, this in a class. Uh, you know, maybe if they choose to go into that area to do a PhD, they will find it. Or maybe if they choose to sign up for a specific cloud like Chicano Studies, but most universities don't even offer that anymore, and uh, or indigenous, uh, you know, cultures or whatever. But very few universities even in touch on that. So I think that component also contributes to the agency that they find and the and the and the identity that is built through the program, uh, through through participation in the academy. So. And, and that is um, so important, that point that you just touched upon, because we, we're always um, reminding leaders that, especially for our communities of color uh, and in working with youth, this is vital, that, that sense of creating empowerment and agency and um, communities where the youth have grown, perhaps is having that sense that they don't have a voice, that they don't have power, that they're marginalized, um, that sense that the resources are lacking. And so then how do we liberate them through precisely mm -hmm. these spaces, right? To see that you have so much more and you have a very rich identity, which uh, at times has not been highlighted, celebrated, talked about. I That was one of the great blessings that I had. Uh, that's how you and I met at the Hispanic Summer Program. I, I was doing my PhD and for the first time, I was introduced to these concepts, right, of understanding our identity and theology and leadership development, how it all comes together from the Latino perspective. And, and it just messed with me because it, it almost had to like, okay, let's do, let's go back to a rewrite. Because <laughs> this is this is not at all what I'm hearing in, mm -hmm. in my institution where I'm doing my PhD. Uh, and, and I certainly didn't have any Latino professors at all. And so that 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 those rich spaces for um, youth of color to be able not only to be with one another, but to reinterpret and understand theology um, from this more inclusive and, and wider approach and, and to understand, I think a lot of, like you're saying, a lot, a lot of the family practices, the community mm -hmm. practices, mm -hmm. the, the language even that we use when we refer to God and what place God has in our lives and why we make the decisions. And I know you were mentioning that that's part of the experience that youth have as they're working through these aspects of developing theology. And, and what have you seen um, as they're grappling with theology and, and their identity as Latinos? Well, I think, uh, and thank you for sharing your own experience, because when you take into consideration, uh, you know, that only like 2% of us end up in uh, from our whole Latinx community in the United States, 2% end up with uh, PhD programs. You know, the whole thing that we have to wait until a PhD program to, to even be introduced to some of these elements that are so vital to our identity is, is, is I mean, it's, it's really sad from my perspective. And is detrimental for some young people that really need these points of reference 
to find their own identity. You know, we talk about um, uh, um, young people that have to uh, live mainly in an Anglo dominated culture, but then at home, you know, we have very different points of reference and say, how, how do they learn to manage that? Or how do they figure out how to manage it? Um, I mean, and, and many do well by themselves, but I think these this, um, uh, uh, points of reference from ancestral, from our ancestors, from our uh, uh, cultures, religions prior to Christianity really help because they resolve a lot of, uh, a lot of um, unresolved or um, uh, elements that, that are seen as negative. You know, one brief example very quickly is, uh, you know, our, our young people like to do, you know, and we call it graffiti in a negative sense, but it's really art. And it's because our languages, most people of particularly Mexico area, Central America, were part of the Nahuatl culture. And the Nahuatl culture before, you know, to be an academic in Nahuatl culture, you had to like be able to be an artist, a poet, a musician. The language is not only a spoken word, it had to be accompanied with, with art, with pictures, pictographs, it's a pictographic language. Uh, and, and it's also a way of translating from one culture to another, from one language to another in the, in the indigenous uh, different cultures and languages. And so a person that was um, in um, what we now consider um, a, a, an academician would have to be, be a translator, an artist, a poet, a musician, and have all of these, uh, you're probably familiar with a traditional flor y canto, which includes this, 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 some of these elements in the, in the Nahuatl culture. So our young people are always like drawing. And, and that's logical because we, it's not enough to just speak, to express themselves with words. They need to express, and it's, it's, it's in our DNA. It has survived within our bodies that we have to communicate through drawing, through music, you know, um, uh, so, so, you know, and we see it as negative. Oh, they're always uh, doing graffiti everywhere. Well, no, they're, they're expressing and we don't listen to it. We erase it, we, you know, we take this artistic part out of them, but it's part of their necessary expression. And those, so those are the things that young people need to hear and, and you know, and, and hear it from, you know, and, and there are, you know, some of our uh, colleagues that, that deal with Chicano studies, that deal with cultural um, uh, components, uh, um, cultural theory that have written about this. So, so it's important to provide our young people in high school when they're dealing with identity issues, um, to provide them with this information that that's more normal than you realize it's normal for a lot for us it might not be accepted in the overall culture it might be like uh, uh, labeled as negative by our churches a religious tradi christian tradition but it's not really foreign to our bodies our bodies our dna our ways of thinking processing our philosophies require that for us to grow for us to be who we are meant to be but all of that has been obscured by Christianity, by, by a lot of um, uh, other cultures that were imposed on us as descendants of the colonizing, these colonizing processes. So for me, um, uh, to share this information uh, with young people uh, when they're in high school, then reinforce and, and work, continue adding to it when they're in college is so vital for their identity and, and agency and empowerment that they, they are able to identify within themselves. And then to succeed, not only to survive, but to, again, to succeed. Mm -hmm. I think that that has been something that keeps resonating with me. How do we help them not only to survive or to stay out of trouble or, or you know, like to create this chaos in their life, but, but to thrive and, and succeed and be able to go beyond um, and, and you were sharing some of the beautiful stories of um, in, in our conversation we, before we started recording, and I was sharing some of our ministry too, how then we see these, these young people who we were able to invest in when they were younger, they were middle school, high school kids, and now they're young adults with families and professions, and they continue this legacy, right, of, of helping the younger generations think theologically, but also helping the church to progress and, and to bring new life and um, air into, into its uh, work and just being able to interpret things from a different perspective. And I know that um, in your work with young people and these theological questions and grappling with all of this, um, it, you, you certainly have heard of these aha moments and stories. Do you have any? I'm curious, like um, what their reaction has been when they um, have these spaces to say, 
wait, let me read scripture. And what is it that I'm seeing and hearing through that? Mm -hmm. Well, in a hum moment for me, following up on the on the story that I share about um, Matthew 15, I mean, uh, an aha moment, I mean, it's always an aha moment with high school students. I'm, I'm amazed at how they react and they're so genuine about their reactions. But an aha moment was when we finished that session, you know, the next day, a young woman comes to me and says, ah, Pastora, Pastora, can I, can I have again the scripture that we worked with yesterday? I want to tell my pastor about this. I mean, and for her to say, I want to tell my pastor, for me, man, the pastor never interpret the scripture that way. <laughs> and so for me, that wasn't, you know, now she's not only thinking about doing different interpretation, but she's already becoming a, a translator and a teacher uh, with this. And, um, and then um, uh, several years ago, I think it was like three or four years ago, one of our graduates from a college group um, accepted a position uh, to work in a bishop's office, the United Methodist Church. We have bishops and they're, they, they're bishops of our region. And so one of our graduates was able to secure a position working with the bishop's office. And so it, it, when she shared that with me and how appreciative she was of Hila, because that's where she learned about how the, the, the structure of the United Methodist Church works and how she began to then really uh, look beyond her local congregation when she participated in Hila, the Hispanic Youth Leadership Academy. That was for me an aha moment. Oh, so this is how it becomes relevant and how she has impacted you know, from her position in a very different way because she makes sure that there is some work that happens with young Latinx um, church uh, leaders or, or um, I mean, leaders in the churches that are working with young people, but she also makes sure that there's something that happens in her region that, that helps um, Latinx um, high school and college students. And then another aha moment for me is the look on the students for, college, for the college groups. As I mentioned, we pull together um, groups of 15, 20 students in each of the academies every summer. And the looks of, um, of everyone when we first gather in a room. To have you know, 18, 20 other college students in the same room, all Latinx students, all Methodist students. Which oh, they you, look like me. you look like me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, wow. And then, uh, and then at the end, when, when they have formed a, a community that becomes so strong that they continue to communicate, even though they live in the very different parts of the country, and then, you know, I know other, I, I constantly have aha moments when I find them in seminary, when I get an email and says, oh, Dr. De La Rosa, I just want to let you know that I, I've been accepted to such and such. Lately is, is acceptance into, into PhD programs, which for me is like, oh my God, you know, they're getting there. We've been doing this for about 18 years. And so now the generation is becoming ordained in the, in the Methodist church. They're becoming um, leaders. Uh, in different institutions, but they also are moving forward. And, and these, these exercises that I mentioned, in, in particularly the interpretation, the process to interpret helps them in, the, in different way. They will preach differently. They will teach differently if they end up being teachers. And then if they end up being community organizers or uh, leaders of, of organizations in the community, they will lead in a very different way. So, so for me, that, that's, that's very important that we continue doing this work with young people. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jan. Just creating those spaces for, for their voice, for connections, for knowing that there's other like-minded uh, youth who want to continue mm -hmm. growing in leadership, in agency, in uh, their theological, biblical understanding, and being able to embrace, I think what you said, um, which is very useful for regardless of any denomination, this tradition within the, the Methodist church, of, it's it's uh, that four square, right, of how do we live, how do we make the decisions through, through the uh, biblical interpretations, our reason, our experience, our tradition, just helping young people um, make that real connection with, with God, with Bible, with theology, with the church. And so what, right? So, so how does that affect my life? And, and you're bringing these spaces where they're able to then tear it apart and say, this is the so what. This is, uh, wow, to read these stories from a completely different perspective and, and to realize that, yes, Jesus and the disciples grew up in a certain uh, culture themselves. 
and they themselves had to be renovated in their way of looking at each other, of relating with one another, of treating women, of treating those who were of different uh, ethnic and racial backgrounds and uh, nationalities. And that was part of their journey as well. And I think right now, um, we keep hearing a lot of churches who are grappling with, with these aspects of racism and, and being able to uh, have more of a wider perspective with other ethnicities and, um, and at the same time grappling with how do we help the church continue its work. And you have presented for us a, a, a beautiful model today of how bringing the different generations together for community, for conversations, for deep conversations, which I think Sometimes uh, leaders feel that if they go so deep or if they talk so much about theology, then youth will be turned off. And it's been your experience as has been ours that to the contrary, they're like, oh, really? Like we really get to talk about something deep and important mm -hmm. and you're making me think. And they're, they're excited by that challenge. So yeah. thank you for, for the, setting that example. Yeah, the, the components of meaning we need to design programs or facilitate uh, ministries that have meaning and relevance. Um, and, and, and it's very difficult to figure out what has meaning and relevance for young people when we're no longer young people. Uh, so I think the best we can do for, um, for our own sake also, because it has to do with, you know, they will be the ones that will help us as we get older, they will replace us. Uh, and, and they are already, uh, helping us in the sense that um, what is is important to ask from them what is meaningful and relevant mm -hmm. for them, mm -hmm. uh, rather than than us telling them what should be meaningful and relevant. And I think the models in most of our Spanish speaking congregations is that the adults are constantly telling the youth what they should believe, how they should believe it, how they should behave, you know, and, and have, having long list of things that they shouldn't do. And I think that this doesn't work anymore. Uh, maybe it worked at some point, but in today's context, in your context of United States, it, you know, it doesn't work anymore. It's, it's so important for me to help them um, or to facilitate that they help us figure out and they figure out what is meaningful and relevant for them. Mm -hmm. And we accompany, we accompany them in that process. In that process of reflection, of critical thinking, of and I always um, share with leaders that it's like really, really, there are best teachers because mm -hmm. they have a very direct pulse on what's going on out there the day to day, and they they can share. They they tell us just like they did in your program. They they said this is what we would like to do. This is how we imagine mm -hmm. that we can continue getting together and having community. And then something beautiful was birthed out of it, but but it came from them, right? From within them. And I think yeah. that's where a lot of our churches could benefit precisely from that, from creating spaces where we can increase the trust that there is, the communication, the relationship, to then go into these um, phases of critical thinking, of being able to tap into each other and say, what is it that we need here? Because we, we see that a lot um, in, in different contexts, right? That they, they want to replicate want to replicate what somebody else is, is doing, or they want to take um, advice about the generations, right? What is the millennials? What is Generation Z? And they just want to take it at face value and go replicate the same thing. And it's like, well, you know, we have kids who are working in the chicken farms uh, right before they go to high school. I don't think they need the same thing as the kids who are over here struggling because they, they're not perfect in their grades and they want to get into the IV school it's like it's it's completely so spend time with them and they will tell you what it is that is relevant for your context for your ministry and and um in creating these spaces for reflection but but i know it can be intimidating for for some leaders to think that way. yeah to share the lead it, it's intimate intimidating to share the leadership with young people particularly because we are led to believe that the adults have priority and we are the ones that have the wisdom and the expert, but um, but it's a, for me it's a matter of sharing leadership and and um, modeling what shared leadership, collective leadership, can be about. Mm -hmm. And um, and we always encourage leaders to think this way that precisely if we want to see them continuing in the church, to have leadership in the community, to flourish, um, the sooner we begin to create these spaces for them 
the more they learn about this. And, and so, of course, in leadership okay. studies, we're always pointing out to the research and over and over again, it's like, yes, of course, human development, the sooner you, the earlier in your life that you learn something and practice it, the more it's going to become ingrained in, in who you are. But somehow we, we had this disconnect, right, of um, leadership and young people and, and youth and children. It's like, no, that's that's for adults, right? And then, and then later we worry. Once they're adults, we want to help them become leaders in, in the community and the church. And there's certainly some aspects of impact we can have, but not as... Uh, as big and, and as um, life-shaping as, as we can when we're there early on. And so we're so grateful for um, ministries like the Hispanic Youth Leadership Academy that is very intentional. And just for me, that was very encouraging, like leadership academy, right? It's like it's like we, we make sure that our young people continue to see themselves in this light too, because they often don't hear that, uh, yes, you are a leader and you're in that formation and emerging Face. And so thank you for, for the big ministry that, that you're thank doing you. there, coming into intersecting in the lives of these young people as they're going through their formation. Yeah, uh, thank, uh, thank you for the invitation. And I have to recognize that uh, um, the Method the United Methodist Church, um, at least uh, one of our national agencies, um, we have an emphasis on Latino Hispanic ministries as one of our missional priorities um, kind of has recognized through that the need for this space. And so um, particularly we have what's called the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry and in their interest to, to uh, create a, a semillero, a space from where we could recruit for our Methodist colleges and seminaries. Um, they have supported this academy for, for 18 years now. And then now we um, are venturing uh, and joining in partnership with the uh, Episcopal Church. Uh, to do the same within the Episcopal Church. So we want to thank also the leadership, the Hispanic leadership nationally from um, the Episcopal Church that has been uh, so committed to creating a, a pipeline because we're looking at how do we establish pipelines of um, Latino leadership within the denominations from high school all the way to doctoral programs. And in the in-between, how do we recruit for uh, clergy, new generations of clergy? So, Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. I think that's going to be very inspirational for several uh, leaders who work at the denominational uh, level yeah. to, to be able to envision their ministry in this wider perspective. So thank yeah. you very much, Dr. Christian, for this engaging conversation. We have learned so much from you today. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Greatly appreciate it. Yes, I know that our conversation can go on and on because <laughs> we're so passionate about uh, young, young, young leaders mm -hmm. in the Latino community to develop. And so we really want to thank our viewers for joining us in this session of Imagining Multiple Models of Ministry with Youth. We pray that these conversations inspire and encourage your efforts in reaching the next generation. And please join us for the next video in the series and leave us a comment, please, about this session. We really want to hear from you.